Hey everyone, um, sorry about that. We just had a technical glitch and had to log back in. Uh, I'm just gonna check whether this is this broadcast is actually live. Um, so I think we're good to go. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Mira and I handle online engagement for the Solutions Journalism Network. If this is the first time you're tuning in, the Solutions Journalism Network is based in New York. We train journalists in newsrooms to do solutions-focused journalism. We are live today with Michael Hobbs, senior enterprise reporter for the Huffington Post. He's also a contributor to Foreign Policy, Pacific Standards, Slate, The New Republic. And he's a co-host of You're Wrong About, which is a weekly podcast. Uh, you can download that from uh, the Apple Store. Today, we're going to talk to Michael about long-form journalism and what goes into really pitching and writing a long-form story. So if you've been wondering how to get started, into, get started with long form writing, or you know, you're just wondering what long form writing is all about, we hope that you can walk away with some great tips and insights today. Um, Michael, we're so glad to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your work. What do you like about long form? So I came to this as a foreigner, because I, before becoming a journalist, I worked in human rights for about 11 years. And long form journalism was just something I did on the side. I was spending a lot of time in Africa and I just kind of started writing about it. And then I started sending pieces to editors. I would just send them word documents of finished articles because I didn't know that there was a whole pitching process and how the whole thing worked. And eventually I got one of them to open one of these documents and they said, yeah, this is okay, we'll publish it. And then I just kind of kept doing it from there. And then since then, I've ended up working at HuffPost. So now I write long form, like one or two long form articles a year. And then I try to write one or two shorter pieces once a week. Well, what is the difference? Like, tell, tell us the difference about, you know, what, what, is long, what is long form journalism? Long form versus short form journalism. What's the big difference? Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's one component of it is the length too, but I think of it more as a methodology. I think with the shorter pieces, you're trying to describe something that's happening and it feels to me like with long form, it's you're trying to describe what is happening and why is happening and what's really behind it. So I wrote an article this morning, it just came out this morning about uh, obesity, about stigma against overweight people. And <clears throat> the short form sort of version of that article, you could write something like, hey, it's really hard to be a larger person in America. It really sucks, people are really mean to you. But the long form version of that is, well, what institutions are behind this? Why is this happening? How long has this been going on? Is it as bad for all overweight people or worse for women or worse for men or worse for people of color? You have to look at all of the different nuances of something. And so you can write a 1,000 or 2,000 word article with a long form kind of tone or a long form feel to it, even if it's shorter. And you can write a longer article that doesn't get into any of those extra layers. And so I think it's really important to think about long form journalism and really the kind of journalism that I think people actually want to read as getting into this complexity and nuance that I think a lot of shorter kind of methodologies of journalism run away from, that you want to find the things that don't make sense. You want to find the things that are internally inconsistent. That's kind of the fun of doing long form journalism is finding all the stuff that doesn't make sense and trying to make sense of it. Right. And how do you really go about doing research into something like this? Because uh, it seems a lot more like that you invest a lot of time in kind of, you know, kind of putting together a pitch for a long form story. How long does it take, you know, to do a pitch for a long form story? And what's the process like? Yeah, I mean, usually with pitching long form stories, it's like you get this kind of nugget of what is going on and then you have to sell the editors on the nugget and then let them give you enough time to really find out what's going on behind it and find the exceptions to that story, basically. Uh, I mean, I've written long form articles that take three months. I, the one that I just published this morning took 16 months. It can, you know, you can interview, some of them I've interviewed 10 or 15 people. The one that I did today, I interviewed 65 people. Uh, that's mostly me procrastinating writing by interviewing more people, however, so it's not, <laughs> I don't recommend this tactic. Um, but it's really about when you find the story. I mean, so much of this is just finding out what's in public documents, what people will tell you, and getting all of the unexpected details. I try to have an unexpected detail in every single paragraph that you're kind of walking people through these articles 
but you're going from interesting detail to interesting detail and never doing that thing that you do as a writer where you think, oh, I have to have this obligatory paragraph. I have to say, to be sure, blah, blah, blah. But trying to really avoid that and saying, okay, what's unexpected here? What's unexpected here? And kind of giving people breadcrumbs through the entire article of the interesting aspects under each structure that you have in the article. Right. And, you know, like we talk a lot about solution stories. And one of the things about solution stories is that, I um, mean, when we talk, when we had done our last Facebook Live, one of the key things that Ryan Lenora Brown talked about is, you know, uh, she talked about the importance of a news pitch, but also that solution stories are not necessarily often, you know, pegged on to the breaking news cycle. So uh, yeah. the story seems very similar. Um, so when you are, when you do have an idea in front of you and you want to kind of like deep dive into it, um, you know, and it's it's a solution that you think is working in one state or in, in a neighborhood, um, you know, what kind of, what, how do you, you talked a little bit about going to public documents and such, but um, given your own work, well, I'd love to know the kind of research that you actually kind of um, start, you know, mm. when you, and how do you really plan out this whole, um, you know, how do you plan out this whole story? Like, how do you get all the information? Mm. I mean, my thing is just reading a lot. I mean, one thing that's kind of amazing as a journalist is that as a freelancer, as a long form journalist, the real luxury that you have is time and being able to think about an issue for a long time before you write about it and being able to talk to people and kind of mull over what you actually think about something before you start writing about it. And one thing I've noticed <clears throat> is that if you read the primary documents about something, that puts you ahead of 80% of the short form journalists that are writing about something. I've actually been really surprised by this. I wrote an article a couple of years ago about the Millennium Development Goals, and I just started out by going on their website, and they have a list of all the background documents and all the annexes and all of the research that went into creating the Millennium Development Goals, and I read it all. And there's really interesting things in there that you wouldn't have expected, and there's a lot of interesting arguments in there and a lot of interesting nuances. And I basically read all those documents and my impression of it was that everyone kind of knew the Millennium Development Goals were going to fail, but they did them anyway. And there's interesting arguments for both sides of that. And really that was just from reading the primary documents. And I've found this with issue after issue after issue, that if you just read what's out there and you talk to people that are doing it, you'll get three or four interesting insights almost immediately. I mean, not, not every issue is going to work like this, but one thing I noticed as a freelancer is that you don't have access, that if you're a freelancer, you don't have a, you know, at newyorker.com email address. Not everyone's going to get back to you and you don't have this kind of inside access of, you know, the palace intrigue at the White House and people close to Donald Trump say, you're not going to have that kind of access. So what you can do to overcome that is to do the work and to talk to people that will talk to you and to read what's been written. And lots and lots and lots of journalists just simply don't have time to do that or don't have the mindset to do that. And so that's really your competitive advantage as a freelancer and as a long form freelancer is to actually get into the nuances of these things and get into the details. And it's surprising how easy these stories are to find once you start reading stuff. Right. And we've also talked a little bit about um... We were, like you did mention a little bit about you know the long form being really about methodology, um, and you know thinking about long form in the broader sense, you know long the kind of long form work that you do for Huffington Post um, versus long form that appears in magazines. How do how do people really tailor ideas uh, for print versus online? You know what is what what is the difference there? Um, I've never been able to understand it. I mean, the, the editorial process is completely different for print than for online, which is something that really surprised me coming not as a journalist to all of this, that there's a whole fact checking process that goes into it. If it's for print, there's the editing process is much more rigorous. There's many more eyes on the story. There's a lot more kind of rejiggering and restructuring and really interrogating the entire piece if it's going into print. Whereas online, there's more of a just kind of put it up there sort of mentality for better or worse. And I think one of the things that freelancers can do with this is what I did early on when I was just kind of doing this on you know evenings and weekends was I tried to aim relatively low. 
I think a lot of people that want to get into this kind of work, they want to start with the New Yorker or the New York Times or getting into print in the Atlantic. And it's really, 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 really hard to do that. And those editors get a lot of emails and they don't open all their emails from people whose names they don't recognize. And one of the things that I did was kind of as practice was I wrote for smaller blogs. I wrote for smaller outlets that people haven't necessarily heard of. And it just got me practice in pitching and in going back and forth with editors and understanding what the process really looks like and honing my own skills of research and getting faster at interviews and faster at reading things. Right. And so I think one of the things when you're starting out is to not necessarily send those pitches to the outlets that you're reading all the time or that you think are really the the peak, that sounds like you're selling yourself short or something, but there's a lot of really interesting publications that are smaller, or they're for a niche audience, and start there, build relationships there, and then work your way up to the you know New Yorker print outlet kind of thing. There's nothing wrong with starting at the second or third tier. Right, and um, because we, have, we are a little short on time, we have some questions coming in. I wanna, mm. I wanna really ask you this question about structuring stories. Uh, you've done a lot of long form, uh, you know, there's characters, there's timelines, there's dates, there's just, would you, do you use a tool to keep track of it? How do you organize? How do you plan it all out? Yes, I use a tool called Scrivener, which is a writing application that allows you to outline as you write. So you can keep all of your interviews in kind of on the left-hand bar and all of your notes on the left-hand bar. And the structuring of these articles, I mean, people focus a lot on the actual writing, the sentence by sentence writing, but so much of the work is in the structure of what do we want to say in the intro? How do we want to tease something? What order do we want to put things in? A lot of these stories aren't necessarily chronological or telling them chronologically is not the best way to breadcrumb information to readers. And so I spend as much time thinking about the structure as I do about the actual words and the actual sentences in the story. And so for me, I do kind of, I call it like the Dewey Decimal System, where I take all my notes, all my research notes, all my interviews, and I put them into topics. So here's something about weight stigma. Here's something about doctors. Here's something about the food system. And then you put all of that together into this huge package, and then you just start condensing it. What are the interesting things here? What are the things that I haven't read before? And to me, it's just keeping, you know, I keep information very raw until the later stages of the process. Just what are the points I want to make? What are the arguments I want to make? What are the quotes I want to use? And just kind of rejiggering them and putting them in different orders and working with my editors to get an outline together right. before I actually start any of the writing, which I think is a really good exercise to start doing. Yeah, and I've heard Scrivener is a great tool. Um, we have we have one question from an audience member. Um, they ask, "What can you do to overcome problems of access as a freelancer?" Mm. I mean, there's no. There's no way around it. The fact that people don't email you back if you have a gmail.com email address, they just don't. And so my way of getting around that is to try to find things that are public. Or one thing I do with researchers quite a bit is if you show a researcher or someone that you know their field and you know their work, oftentimes they will be much more likely to get back to you. That if you say, hey, I'm writing an article about this, get back to me they're gonna ignore it. Whereas if you say, you know, in 2011, you published this article and you mentioned that men and women have this disparity in this disease, I wanna know why. Then they're like, oh, this person's actually read my work. They're interested in what I'm doing. And so that's one of the only ways to do that is to show people that you're not like a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am type of journalist that's just gonna, you know, go in, go out, publish something and not even get back to them. That you're actually thinking deeply about this issue that they think really deeply about. And so you're, I've never been able to crack the code actually of getting sort of inside sources. I, to this day, I still don't have a lot of access you know, inside institutions, but I've gotten around that by talking to people that are studying those institutions and trying to work my way into these fields from there. Another rule that I learned from human rights is whenever you have an interview with somebody, always ask them three more sources mm -hmm. or three other people I should talk to. And then that of course makes it easier. Hey, I got your name from Sarah. You know, you're both in the same field and then they'll be more likely to get back to you. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's hard. There's no easy way around it. Right. And I think like, um, I think one of the things that you've talked about sources is really, uh, is, is really a key point here because building that list of sources to kind of maintain, uh, you know, your, your source of stories, good stories coming in is always a good thing uh, as a freelancer. I think the second part of the question is, you know, a lot of uh, this person has asked is, 
lot of journalists don't have the time to do um, to do that, which is you know digging so deep into stories. So what's your competitive advantage as a long form freelancer? Um, do you call yourself a long form freelancer at all? I know you do some long form stories, but um, uh, I mean, I you know when I had a different day job, the only kind of journalism that really interested it, me was feature stories. Uh, so I sort of did identify as that, although now I kind of do short and long together. But I think the biggest thing is, you know, if you can't, if you don't have the access and you don't have the time necessarily, the biggest thing is to make yourself a subject matter expert. I mean, I was, when I started doing this, I was working in international development. So I would go to Zimbabwe for work and then I would write a long form article about Zimbabwe because I had spent a year or two researching the country. And so maybe for you it's, you know, national security or maybe it's sexual harassment law or maybe it's workplace or, you know, become an expert in something. And that then allows you to pitch these articles from a well of deep expertise. But I think the most important thing is to really develop that well of deep expertise. There's so many issues that are undercovered, especially right now, that if you can become, you know, the leading freelance expert on, you know, toxicity in the water supply, and you can write three or four articles about toxicity in water and what's happening with lead and et cetera, et cetera, then that actually gives you a real advantage over other journalists. So I would find something that other people aren't covering and just become a huge nerd with understanding the institutions, understanding the debates within that field, follow all the Twitter people, and just get really into a specific issue. And that's something editors always need. Right, right. And I, you know, I would love to talk more, but we are a little short on time today. So my last question, what advice do you really have for journalists who are just starting out exploring long form? I know that, you know, you've said, uh, to kind of, you know, become a subject matter expertise, expand your sources, keep reading. Uh, but, you know, long form is hard to get around. And when you look yeah. at solutions where, you know, now, now you have a lot of fellowships, people kind of bringing forward all of these innovative solutions that claim to kind of uh, be that, the, that one and only solution for a, a specific problem. And at, you know, SJN, which I explore, tell people, you know, there's no one solution to every problem. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like how do you really, um, what advice would you like to give to journalists who are trying to really look at solutions using a long form lens? I think just start doing it. I mean, that's, this is one thing that I didn't really realize that I could, and I just started writing essays and putting them on my blog and eventually they started getting linked to. And it sort of opened up that you can actually just do this, that if you have actual expertise and you're saying things that are true, people will want to read that no matter what length it is. And so in general, I think a lot of freelancers that are kind of trying to get into this will wait to get that perfect New Yorker pitch or wait to write up the article, but just write it, start writing. And if, it's, if it doesn't end up being 3000 words and it's only 1200 words, then great. Write it and move on and send it to some editors and start, developing relationships and just start doing it. And it, you know, it's one of the last sort of democratic fields that you can really just do this work and you can be eventually published in places like the Atlantic or these other publications that you've been reading. But the trick is to just do it. And your first couple articles aren't going to be Pulitzer prize winners. And that's totally fine. You know, the first time you went skateboarding, you weren't very good at it. Just keep doing it and keep getting better and keep developing relationships with editors. And eventually you'll get an act for it and you'll get faster at it, but just start doing it. Well, that's such a great note to end on. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Michael, thanks for all your insights. Uh, thanks. And our members who are watching and asking questions. Thank you for making it and putting up with us and being patient with the technical, technical problems that we faced. If you want to ask Michael a question, he is on our Facebook group. So, you know, always feel free to kind of, Send him a message or like, you know, just, uh, you know, we've posted on the Facebook group. So kind of carry the thread forward and carry the conversation forward. Um, I would ask you, please subscribe to his podcast. It's called You're Wrong About. And it yeah. really is a podcast that deep dives into issues that we are wrong about. Uh, it's a fun podcast. So check it out. Uh, if you're look, looking, you know, for leads uh, to magazines and um uh, media outlets that are looking for solution story pitches, go to our website, solutionsjournalism.org, and sign up on our hub. Uh, you will have access to a whole list of publications accepting solution stories. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in today, and we'll see you next week.